go for it. I have the mic, yeah. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Ivan Kostic, and uh, it's a pleasure to present uh, Mark and Peter Anderson through the Digital Media Collaborative, a student group that explores uh, possibilities of uh, digital design and fabrication. Um, as we're a group that explores uh, innovative design and construction methodologies, uh, we found a fun quote from the, their website. Uh, it's from the seminar taught by Mark Anderson at UC Berkeley in 2009 called Enormous Plastic Crane Flower. Uh, so it's uh, this, I have a plan, but since we're asking nobody's permission, it also follows that you should feel free to deviate from my plan or to throw it out altogether in favor of some more radical plan of your own making that is even more power, powerful and theatrical than any possibility that I'm imagining. In either case, our plan must be bold, spectacular, and effective. I would also like to si stipulate that fairly or unfairly, nobody gets hurt. Um, so it seems to us that it's a worthwhile and meaningful approach uh, to designing and the design and construction exploration. Uh, so they established their uh, firm in 1984 and have worked in the US and Japan um, and won uh, numerous prizes. You can check those on their website. Usually they're listed now. Um, so just please welcome uh, Peter and Mark Anderson. Thank you, Thank you all. I, I'm Peter, he's Mark. And we're sharing one mic tonight, so we're, we're going to hand it back to Mark. So please again, remind us. Can everyone hear? This is. And this mic is for uh, posterity at the library and not, not for your use. Uh, but you can hear all right? Okay. Um, so Feel free to raise your hand in the back or wave or something if, of course, we can't see you now. But it, okay. if we drop our voices, someone stand up and, and wave and we'll, we'll try to speak louder. So we're going to talk back and forth a, a little bit. Um, sometimes we do half the lecture by me and half by Peter, but um, we're going to try to do it a little more interactively this time. So we'll see what, what happens. Um, so just to, to start out, we wanted to talk about a few things that are um, very much in our thinking at the moment. They're, they're part of what the world is thinking about at the moment. And actually, it has um, what, what's happening in the world right now has a lot of historical antecedents, too. So. Um, we just wanted to start with this uh, quotation, uh, which has been something we've thought about for a, a long time because one of our uh, teachers in, in school uh, taught a, um, a seminar about Le Corbusier. And this guy, Jersey Sultan, um, had been a, a disciple of Le Corbusier. And he, he was a very old man when we knew him, but he had been a, a young person working with Le Corbusier. And uh, he often uh, talked about the, uh, the, the time before World War II uh, when the, the European modern architects were uh, working in uh, SIAM, the Congress Internationale de Architecture Moderne, uh, which you've probably heard about in your um, history classes. But uh, there was a lot of uh, political concern in in culture generally, in, in the world of art and in architecture. So within architecture, there were, were a lot of debates about uh, how much we should be concentrating on issues of uh, the, the sort of formal aesthetic um, uh, representation in architecture and how much we should be dealing with the social and political issues. And of course, that history has, has come with us um, down to the current time. And it, it kind of rises and falls, the, the tide of uh, academic and uh, professional interest in uh, being very attentive to either the social political issues or very attentive to the formal issues. Uh, so at that time, they were talking about this, how can we speak of roses when forests are burning? So this was a, um, a slogan of debate within the SEAM conferences. and. Uh, once again, now we're at a time when many people think the forests are burning. There's uh, 
many economic problems, political problems. There's a lot of uh, hopelessness and despair in the world. Uh, so again, we're confronted, uh, and even in our short careers of 30 years, I suppose, uh, not so short to most of you, but it seems short to us, uh, there have been these ups and downs uh, in terms of um, our, our faith in what we can do as architects and our, our sense of possibility, our sense of what uh, we're going to be able to do when we get out in the world and start working. So we're at a moment of uh, similar crisis and debate right now. So uh, we, we've just overlaid this um, quotation uh, from the, the Siam debates over the, uh, an image of the, the city where we grew up, not so far from here, Tacoma, Washington. And it's, it's kind of emblematic, uh, this particular image is kind of emblematic to us of both the, uh, the, the sort of difficulty of, uh, that, that we face as architects between uh, a kind of responsibility to the natural world and a fascination and responsibility towards the economic industrial world. So this is the, the tide flats of Tacoma, Washington, a, a kind of horrific place on the one hand, a kind of super fund waste site, uh, industrial polluted place, set in this uh, incredible landscape that we, we know from Oregon and Washington, uh, beautiful water and uh, mountains and so forth. Uh, so th th we have this, even, even within our landscape, we have this sort of um, uh, debate that, that confronts us. What, what, what can we do? What are our responsibilities? Um, so th this is a, a drawing uh, that I did in the mid-1980s uh, at what was actually kind of a similar time uh, economically, um, but a, a similar time of concern about these questions of uh, w w what are we doing in the modern world, what is, uh, what is our responsibility, what are our um, possibilities. So th this was a drawing looking at um, the, the kind of pre-war uh, European attitude towards uh, uh, modernity and towards industrialization. Uh, so on, on the one side we have Le Corbusier uh, and his uh, L'Esprit Nouveau. We have Leger's paintings that are kind of a celebration of, of industry and modernity and possibility. And then at the same time on the other side we have a much darker vision of modernity and a much darker vision and understanding of uh, the modern world at that at that time. So Paul Clay's paintings and uh, drawings. And then uh, at the uh, the bottom here is a, a drawing by Le Corbusier that has always fascinated Peter and me and has been very important in, in our thinking about architecture. And it's a uh, it's this Janus face. Uh, it's a kind of two two-sided mask and, and a mask of Medusa at the same time uh, with the, the snakes. Um, so th this was something that Le Corbusier drew in 1948, shortly after World War II, when there was certainly a, a, a lot of um, uh, kind of astonishment at what uh, horrors the modern world could produce and a lot of soul searching about what architecture should be what uh, anything uh, should be culturally in this time. So he, he has this kind of two-faced mask, this kind of sad mask of uh, horror and the, the sunny mask of possibility of his L'Esprit Nouveau, what the possibility of the, the modern world. So uh, then more recently, much more recently, uh, Peter and I made this uh, mask, which it's a little hard to decipher here, but it was for a, an exhibition in San Francisco a couple of years ago. Um, and it deals with the same issue. It's this Janus mask. And in this case, it was, it was for an exhibition debating a certain issue in the city of San Francisco um, in architectural terms. So our, um, it was a call for proposals, so there were like six architects invited to make proposals for something happening in San Francisco. And, and most of the architects submitted architectural proposals. We didn't, uh, and we feel this is an architectural proposal, but it's more of a, a study of the architectural condition 
uh, particularly in, in San Francisco, but uh, more generally. So half of the mask is um, this, this mask full of the, the possibility of life. It's kind of the California dream, the, the kind of 60s modern, uh, the West Coast dream of possibilities, future, uh, happiness, um, kind of freedom. And then, uh, with, which is part of what we think of in San Francisco. And then the other half of what we think about in San Francisco is the uh, say no to everything. Say no to everything new. Don't let any new buildings happen. Don't let any uh, new possibilities kind of stir up the historical um, pattern here. And then th there's also within all of that and below it is, is this huge history within San Francisco and the West Coast generally of a, a kind of a war like, uh, there's a nuclear um, arms industry. There, there, there's a whole subtext of, of the culture that we, that we work within. So th this was um, a kind of production uh, of our, our, our reading of this situation at that time. And there's quite a few layers to this. This is a, uh, a three-dimensional thing. It's, it's all built out of um, housing types that we've uh, produced. So it's a, it's a mass-produced, prefabricated housing system. Construction uses all of our uh, kind of basic uh, systems within this. And then the, uh, the model itself is made out of uh, folded, uh, laser cut and folded uh, paper. Um, so it's a, uh, it, it comes right out of the, the kind of drawing, working, modeling, digital uh, fabrication processes that we work with a lot. And then within this kind of depth of about one foot, there's a lot of uh, additional layers of stuff, including there's about 100 fortune cookies in there with texts that unroll. And on one side of the uh, texts are, uh, one side of the fortune cookie texts are maybe 30 feet of zoning rules in San Francisco. And on the other is uh, Ginsburg poems and different things. So a, a kind of two-sided nature of, of the world that we live in. So um, th this is a, a kind of long way to get into um, looking at, at some of the background that's within our work. We're, we're very much engaged in uh, construction processes and thinking about how things are made. And, and that includes uh, how things are made uh, in terms of production processes, fabrication processes, drawing through fabrication processes, and uh, construction industry processes. But also, um, once you get into these issues, of course, of production, you're also in issues of economy and inevitably uh, issues of how all of this fits into the larger economic political structure. So we, we've always had uh, multiple streams within our work. And one of the streams has to do with a certain amount of anger and frustration and, uh, and hope uh, for the world. So we, we've done lots of projects of uh, protest and clamping onto buildings and bullhorns that uh, scream and uh, different sorts of uh, sort of political uh, issues within our work. And that, that's all subsumed within uh, this kind of overall strategy of looking at how architecture fits into um, the larger world, both in terms of these kinds of digital mappings of uh, a kind of cultural stream within which we work and a kind of landscape um, stream. So thinking of the landscape, uh, both as a very, very much a natural and, and urban physical construct, but also thinking of it as a kind of uh, sensorial uh, and uh, perceptual uh, construct. So we, we've built a lot of projects. This was, um, you know, more investigative projects as well as our building projects, which we'll look at a little bit too. But in some of these more investigative um, projects like this one was built in a museum in uh, Anchorage, Alaska about, I guess, 15 years ago already. But it's, uh, it's a, an, an exploration of the perception of space um, in, in a full range of, of body um, 
perception mechanisms rather than the, just the visual one. So it's a, um, and I won't go into a whole lot of detail about this, but it's a hot plate, cold plate system. There's um, uh, a system of hot water and chilled water uh, within this um, symmetrical, visually identical uh, bifurcated space. There's um, uh, absolute visual sameness, but a, a range of other differences between the two sides. And uh, you're blinded by the light, which was um, a kind of reference to the, the type of light that you get in Alaska, which is this kind of low horizontal blinding light that uh, is felt as a, as, as a sensation more so than as a visual wavelength of light. And it's a kind of blinding light. So within this blinding light, we then constructed these bladders and uh, radiators and systems for bringing um, uh, heat, different heat uh, sensations. And then this was uh, salt water mud flat mud that we brought up from the uh, the waterfront, and so one half of it was cold, clammy mud, one half of it was very warm mud, and so there's very different smells, very different sounds, very different kind of sensations. So within this um, this physical structure, then we were very interested in uh, how do we visualize this thing that we've, first of all, denied our visual uh, reading of it. Uh, so how do we give some form, some visual form to our other senses. So we started exploring infrared video and uh, we were able to start perceiving the space as this much more sort of complex, dense uh, space. So in, in this case, this is the real person and we're not seeing visual wavelength light in this. We're only seeing um, heat. Uh, heat energy. So in, this is the reflection heat reflection embedded within the, the architectural uh, construction. So we, we become very um, interested uh, through all this time in, in these sorts of uh, ways that we, we perceive space, we engage space in ways that are not just formal and visual, they're much more um, kind of sensorial. Uh, so that, that's part of our interest in the landscape is this kind of uh, perception, sensation of the landscape. Uh, and we've made many machines and many projects about um, perceiving the landscape. So these machines in Texas that are directed into the wind and that allow you to get up into the wind and experience the, the horizon line. And then more recently in Texas, we built this small structure that is a uh, uh, it's a shade structure, shade pavilion, and uh, living roof uh, demonstration project. It's a, a kind of traveling folding mechanism. Uh, but all of these things are, are armatures for the creation of experience. So as a, as a construction, the, the actual form of it and the, the material construction of it is less interesting to us. Or, is secondary in its uh, design uh, focus than is the uh, the sort of perception that it uh, the, the kind of human experience that it makes possible and and these are things that we'll show you in some of the other uh, built projects so th there's that kind of background of the the subject matter the um, the interest in terms of what we're producing that's uh, a little broader than the interest in just the details. The details themselves are interesting, but details in them on their own are not really the objective of architecture. Fabrication processes are not the objective of architecture. They're tools and mechanisms for making possible a certain sort of human occupation, human inhabitation of the world. So all of these things are um, kind of fascinating from the point of view of how do you make them? How do they get produced? What, what's the industry? What's the, the mechanism? But that's always within the context of a, a larger engagement. So Peter's going to talk about some of how some of that works in a site-specific way with some of our, our houses. So with that, that background kind of about the, the theoretical 
stance, that really comes into projects that we have that where we're doing a project for a client or, or a, a larger built project. And it's nice to kind of start with this image of the bulldozer because um, we grew up in Washington. A lot of the, our projects that we did, our earlier projects of design and construction were in beautiful landscapes of native forests. That they might have been logged at one point long ago or sometimes not, but often the, the first stage of building something is actually a very destructive act of tearing down the landscape and the nature. So th this is a very strong image for us. We've spent a lot of time on these uh, dusty, muddy construction sites surrounded by beautiful landscape and um, helping direct the, the, the work of the bulldozers and trying to maintain certain trees that were particularly important to us and, and kind of maybe crying inwardly a little bit with every tree that has to come out. But it, 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 it's kind of an awe-inspiring way to start a project, to start a building, because you feel like this, there's this huge responsibility that whatever you replace this little, little piece of nature that you're tearing up to build something, it, it, it better be a good contribution or useful or beautiful or in some way um, worth, worth doing. So that's kind of the, the, the landscape, if you will, of, of the work that we consider site site built or site um, site dependent work. Some of it in all of our work involves some combination of on site and off site production. But in particularly a, a series of houses that relate very much to how things are made and how they fit into the landscape. So we did start our business as a construction company before we were licensed as architects and that gave us the opportunity to start designing things but also a tremendous uh, learning platform for us to learn about materials, learn about space, learn about how things can connect to the landscape. So I'd say um, you know, this, the study of the site and how a building goes onto the site is sort of a central theme to all of this. And it also then sets the theme for the fabrication of any parts that are going to be brought, brought into the site. Another part of the landscape besides the physical landscape or the environmental or the kind of natural landscape is the landscape of the um, kind of industrial landscape, the set of tools and resources that are out there for making things. So in addition to studying the, the topography of the land, we're always interested in the topography or landscape of the means of production. So, for instance, with these, th this uh, kind of complicated steel stairway, the first thing that we did was to try to find the places that could roll steel for us. So this happened to be on the, the tide flats, the picture Mark showed at the beginning of this industrial processing place. And the design came completely out of a series of conversations back and forth with the people who would actually be able to bend the, the structural members and the the interaction with the making, both our own hands-on part, but more and more working towards the um, interactions with fabricators and people we could work with. So we understand that in the same way as a, a landscape that is uh, a rich source of inspiration and it's it's a, a collaborator in a way with, with any project. So I, I think that, that influences a lot. We, started working a lot with, with wood um, and um, now more recently a broader range of, of materials. But in a, a project like, like this one, the study of the, the land, the study of the people who could help us realize the project, make the, um, the parts and pieces, that's the, the kind of site specific landscape that is um, very much a part of the, the work. To be even kind of another more clear example, this is a, a project um, we were asked to to build a, a little complex of buildings, uh, a house, two houses and studios for uh, an extended family. They bought a, a beautiful five-acre site that had been in an orchard, uh, apple tree orchard, for a um, hundred years. So the first thing we we went to the site and. Five acres seems like a lot of 
land and they said tell us where we should build the house and the um, first thing we realized that the, the site was completely full it was it was full of trees and the there wasn't any you know there wasn't a you know, there, it was a constant slope over it there w weren't any kind of immediate landmarks and so the first thing we did was we started walking up and down the rows of trees understanding how they were organized They'd been planted 100 years ago, most of them. Some of them were recently, but on a grid, a 25-foot grid. So we started doing a series of drawings. And before we could understand ourselves where we thought a building should go, we, we started chronicling every tree. There's 225 trees, I think. So we, we, started, we, we made rows and numbers, and we started um, studying the trees that were there. We made drawings and then we photographed every tree, which was really interesting. We indexed the drawings to the photographs, and we kept thinking, you know, this is—it's going to become clear to us as we study this um, how and where where we might um, might introduce a, a building into the landscape. And it wasn't really until it, we were really kind of stuck on this, and we started doing more interpretive drawings from the data that we collected. This is actually a woodblock um, print that we were doing that started to analyze things by the, um, the, size, the size of the trees, the health of the trees. And we started to see um, ways that there, are, there were patterns within. There were areas that were, um, even though there were trees there, they were smaller trees or there were unhealthy trees or something. So we started to find a landscape with, within a landscape that wasn't initially apparent. And then based on that, we started introducing building elements into it, into this, um, this void first in, in models. We, we modeled the whole thing, we modeled all the trees. And we decided that the, the, the solid building elements had to maintain the, the same rows, the orchard rows, because what we were aware of is that the, the space of this site is the space between the rows of trees, and we didn't want to block them with buildings. So we said the rows of the trees have to all be, be glass or open space, and the, the concrete structure, the, the solid structure, had to be on the line of the trees. I mean, we, these are actually the construction drawings for the building. We, we put every tree, we, we drew every tree or, and or photographed every tree. They're in all the construction drawings. So there's no mistake for anyone working on the project that the the project of the building is about the building and the trees. And you can see from these that the trees are all taller than, than the, the buildings. So it was one of the important goals for us is keeping the building within the context of the trees and lower, lower than the trees. So the, we made this series of, um, these are concrete cast in place um, using mobile modular forms, um, columns and in concrete elements which are all on the lines of the trees. And this, this image looking out from the kitchen is probably a good way of seeing straight ahead into the picture is the, the alley of, of um, space between the rows of trees. And on either side of us are the, the rows of the, the concrete columns of the house. So we're, <clears throat> we're trying to create an atmosphere of the inside of the house where the floor goes right out into the dirt and the ceiling goes right out into the sky to kind of connect us in. And the, the whole wall system opens up as a series of doors. There really are no windows in the building. They're all doors, all made out of uh, recycled uh, wine um, casks that were made out of, of redwood. So there's a very limited palette of materials on the, on the building. To give another example of that kind of extreme interaction with the, the site. Um, this was a, a beautiful 150 acre site up in the mountains north of Seattle. It had um, a very big site, but it really had very little buildable area on it. And the, the site that with the owner, we, we found most, actually the owner wanted to build on, wanted us to design for another site and we kept convincing him or trying to convince them and eventually did that th that was the site you needed to look at and we needed to build on this this other site which he thought of as unbuildable. But what 
what became important to us was to lift the building up off the site, make the smallest possible foundation, and then cantilever the building out in all directions. So at one end it cantilevers 35 feet, and the other end it cantilevers 20, 20 feet or so. So it's a steel structural um, moment frame, a Virendil truss frame, that um, we designed to allow the building to have the small, small footprint and then um, cantilever out essentially over this, this, this cliff. So this is a very different kind of building from the, the previous one, which was about sitting on the site down low. In this case, it was a, uh, a site that uh, it made more sense to be kind of up and, and up above the, the site and cantilevering out. Moving around the, the, the country, this is New Mexico. Now, another a very beautiful and specific site on a river where the owners wanted a, a building that would, uh, it was both a, a house for themselves, but they had a lot of domestic animals, and it's in a very wild um, site in Abiquiu, New Mexico, and they needed to separate their domestic animals from, which included um, plans for goats and, chi and chickens, from the, um, the wild animals that roam through the, the desert landscape. So the house was conceived from the beginning as this kind of multi cellular um, cage, but cage usually sounds kind of uh, unpleasant, but it's a very diaphanous open cage. The, the connection to the landscape included a very, um, it was a very high elevation, so a lot of studies of how do we get sun in for passive heating of the, of the site in the, in the winter onto a, a floor of concrete that would absorb the warmth in the winter. But then in the summer when the sun is hot, um, excluding the light from those, those thermal retention areas. So we started uh, doing a lot of work with Ecotech. I don't know if that's the software you use, but the ability to, to study lots of different ways that the building interacts with the site. So I think this is kind of marking a, a transition for us from the more intuitive um, kind of understanding the site from being on it to learning that there are more tools available to us, increasingly so, to use more um, kind of d definitive um, analytical information to help form the, the ideas of the buildings. And, and lastly in this series, another orchard project, which is very different. This one is it's on the poster we saw. Uh, this is a house in, in Michigan that sits above a cherry orchard. In this case, a tiny site set within a huge agricultural landscape. And the goal was to get as high as possible to get over the cherry trees to be able to look out at a view of a lake. So this house is only 1,600 square feet. It sits in this uh, kind of cherry orchard landscape. And the, uh, the 1,600 feet are spread over, um, there's a total of 12 levels in the house. It's, it's really five stories, but they're half, half levels. Each, each room is off half of a level. So the, in this case, the importance of the, the building to us was getting up high above the site. But then the, the exterior uh, enclosure of the building is all reflective surfaces of a, uh, a reflective metal and then with a, land, a, a separated level of, of uh, plastic louvers that collect and um, redistribute the light. So part of the goal then of building the house was to have it set into the landscape in a way where it reflects and changes with the, the, the four seasons that this, uh, this building goes through. You can see here that uh, kind of the idea that the building reflects the sky and it, uh, we call it the chameleon house because it, it kind of does change with the, the seasons and the land and the, um, reflects its, um, its surroundings. So it's not trying to blend in, but it's trying to become a uh, kind of connected integral piece of the landscape. So that, that, that's kind of the, the series of very site directed kinds of projects. And Mark will take over for a minute here. So uh, along with uh, this interest in uh, being very site specific because you know, the world is full of amazing places
places and no matter where you're building, there's something um, amazing as, as a context to, uh, to generate ideas and, and to respond to and to be responsible to. Uh, but just as there's a, that kind of specific landscape, there, there is this kind of production um, landscape that we work within. And we've always been very um, interested in uh, affordable methods of uh, housing production in particular and building production. And we have had the opportunity to, to build some pretty expensive buildings for um, fairly wealthy people. Um, but that's never been our, our, our primary interest. Uh, our primary interest has been to figure out how we can make um, good buildings uh, available to everybody. So we, we've always had this kind of parallel um, emphasis on figuring out a production method that, that is affordable, that is effective in, in some way. So this, you know, one of our early projects um, along these lines was a house we built um, on Fox Island in, in Washington State about 20 years ago. Um, and that was one of our, our first uh, prefabricated buildings that we did completely ourselves. We, we'd actually, actually been working on a number of other things earlier, including for some other architects. But this one uh, was a, a house for um, a young woman who was a teacher. She later became a firefighter um, and a, a very interesting person, but um, somebody who didn't have a lot of money and wanted to do some of the work on the house herself. So we had to really uh, figure out how to make something that could be built very fast, very affordably. and. Um, so we developed a kind of panelized uh, production system. And in this case, we rented a, a warehouse and used our own construction crews kind of between other projects and prefabricated the thing and then uh, set it up on, on the house, uh, on the site in a fairly rapid way. So that, that was one of our early um, investigations in uh, prefabrication, but we, we've always, been working on numerous projects in different um, different methods of prefabrication. So th this project um, here is, is a project in Kumamoto, Japan, where we've also um, done a lot of work on prefabricated buildings. So th this one was built, it was finished a just a couple of years ago, and it's a CAD CAM timber frame uh, building. Um, so we, we've worked in kind of modular construction and timber frame prefabrication and panelized construction. Uh, always trying to figure out ways to uh, use a production process to make both an affordable, efficient, effective way to make something, but also something that then is a, a kind of special place to live and is repeatable. So this, this series of um, houses that I'm showing you, in each of them, the intention was, uh, and this one actually is also for some school teachers, um, and in, in each of these, the amount of research that goes into um, figuring out how to make a, a house, even for wealthy people, it doesn't really, uh, the fees don't really pay the, the time it takes. So the, uh, the intention in these was to put some investment into it uh, and to make the possibility for these to be repeated and to have uh, the cost of all the work, the design work and the, the production set up and so forth to be able to be amortized over, over the longer term. So these are all uh, intended to be production houses, but still very adaptable to their sites. So in, in this case, the site is in Kumamoto and some beautiful hills overlooking uh, the city. And it is a very, very simple, repeatable logic, but it is uh, somewhat adapted to the, to the light. This is also a zero energy house. Um, it's completely, even though it's kind of dominated by electric wires, it's a completely solar um, powered house. Um, th this is a, a house in Palo Alto that is just finishing uh, construction. And, um, 
it's not a not panelized like the first one. It's not timber frame like the second. This is a a modular house that's built uh, pre-built in a factory in Oregon, in, Oregon yeah, in, in Salem. So this was built in Salem and then trucked down to um, to Palo Alto. Um, so th this again is intended to be, and of course in the San Francisco area, everything is kind of outrageously expensive anyway. So when we talk about an affordable house, it's still a million dollar house, but it's uh, a, uh, it's not affordable to most of us, but uh, compared to what other things are, it's uh, a less expensive way to build. So it, it's a very compact, um, very simple house that is on a small site, so much of the outdoor yard space is on the, on the roof of the house. And this is a, uh, a plan of the module. So it was trucked down in, in five modules. And uh, each of these is, is, needs to be designed to be detached. So there, there are some kind of special design issues. Uh, but then the idea is to put it all back together. So it, it's completely built in the factory, then taken apart and brought to the, uh, the site. And in this case, you can see they're, they're kind of simple box-like structures, but uh, trying to kind of embrace that simple box-like quality and give lots of uh, indoor-outdoor space in it. So this is the beginning of the, the work in the factory in Salem. This is the, uh, the process. And um, here's the house going together. It has... Uh, it, it's basically very simple materials, but it's got a few special features, including this kind of uh, wall full of holes that it, it encloses a small bamboo courtyard. Um, it's just a hardy board, simple cement board siding, so very inexpensive, but um, put together in a way that is a little less typical of the use of it. Here it is going over the the wires and over the trees and uh, being set in place. Uh, once it goes together, then there's uh, some of the, at all of the module lines, there's a kind of knitting together of the, the pieces. And here you can see uh, it's finished inside, but there are some areas left to be bolted together and then finished. Um, so this is the interior and the courtyard wall, and this is about what it looks like now or it's just a little bit beyond this but it's um, uh, it looks like it's kind of fit into the trees so it doesn't really look like it was trailered in uh, so we've been increasingly interested in um, modular building recently because uh, it's a little different from other modes of prefabrication it's the, the kind of true promise of prefabrication where the whole thing goes together. So I'm going to show you a few, a few more examples of um, current and recent modular building projects that are, are not, not residential, not houses. So the um, and kind of thinking of the, the larger landscape of uh, education related projects, it, we kind of, we're very excited to have had a chance recently to get involved in some projects more about education facilities because we feel like putting the effort into um, you know, very intensive design and, and development of things makes more sense for something that can be um, benefiting more people than just a single family house. And so in particular, th this project, which um, is a zero net energy classroom for Hawaii, it, we were part of a competitive uh, process to find the best proposal for a, it, it's supposed to be the new generation of portable classrooms or relocatable classrooms for the state of Hawaii. They use a lot of them. They, many of the classrooms they have are in, in very poor condition. So they decided to have this, this kind of idea to have a prototype for a zero net energy classroom. So our project was, was selected. These are images of how it will break down into modules. Um, it's actually under construction right now, so it is being built as a completed building. But we approached it very much as a, a system of, of 
of parts that can be deployed. Um, there's a, a wide range of climate throughout the Hawaiian Islands, and they say that eventually they have as many as 10,000 different units in, spread out through the islands that will need replacement. So we wanted to, to approach this, even though we had a specific site for the initial uh, building, we wanted to approach it very much as a, a flexible system to adapt their different environmental needs in different areas of the, um, of the islands. So the, we really approached it as a machine for, first of all, reducing its energy use. Even before we started collecting energy, the idea was to reduce its energy use to as little as possible. So that happened through daylighting strategies and through natural ventilation and, and cooling. So it uh, won't be air conditioned, which is rare in Hawaii for classrooms. So a lot of study, we had a, a really terrific uh, team of consultants um, from all over the country helping work on this and helping work out all the different strategies for natural cooling and, and daylighting and water collection and storage. So even though it's a very small building, it's only a thousand square feet, it, it's one of the most studied buildings. It's been modeled in, in every kind of software and it's you know, studied up one side and down the other. And we hope it will perform. So we have all of this performance um, data that was required as part of uh, the, um, the state of Hawaii's uh, selection process. So it was a very kind of rigorous process where we had to model everything. And now there will be a, a monitoring process once it is installed and um, operating to see how well it, it matches according to the um, to the, the projections. So th that's an interesting new kind of landscape that we all have to be aware of and designed for is um, kind of standards-based design where there are performance standards for how a building will perform. And it's, uh, we, we have software tools now to be able to do extremely accurate modeling, or at least we hope it's accurate because uh, we hope that the building lives up to its um, expectations. So this is um, under construction at the same factory that built the ho house that Mark just showed previously. So it's, it's here um, in Salem, outside of Salem. It's called Blazer Manufacturing. These are pictures from our last trip up here about a month ago. Um, tomorrow morning we get to go up there and see it uh, in almost finished state. So we'll have fresh pictures after tomorrow morning. But this is the, the building under construction in the factory. It will be then disassembled into pieces and then brought to, um, by, by ship to Hawaii. Just these images are kind of showing it as this, this system approach. We developed a number of different um, roof lines for um, and different characteristics for different climates. So for more southerly latitudes or um, as far north as New England and Boston, we have different variations on it. This is a, uh, a version we developed for a, a site in Nevada. And then um, this, this series of images uh, kind of showing how it can be, um, the exterior can be changed, it can be branded and adapted for a wide variety of applications, both educational and research and, and, and technical. The, the other kind of education building we just finished um, two years ago now for was kind of, we, we were selected for the Hawaii project. It won a number of awards, but it didn't get built because of, uh, it was slow to get built. But in the meantime, a new project came in that had to get designed and built in a matter of six months. So it came in be as a result of the work we'd done on the other one, but it actually got designed and built first. So this was a child care center for Harvard University. They needed a, temporary, a two-year space while they were renovating some of their larger buildings that had child care centers in them. So it was a very kind of controversial thing. The, the Harvard uh, um, campus is, has a lot of people watching it all the time that for what they're trying to do. They have a, a tense relationship with their, their neighbors. So the idea of putting in a, a temporary building um, had to be something that the neighbors would accept and which would uh, perform very well. So it was, it was kind of a high stakes 
project with a lot of people watching it. And it also had to be done in a very, very short period of time and at a very low budget. So this project has a much lower budget per square foot than the, the Hawaii project, but it <clears throat> had very high ambitions, not as much for energy production, because that's a very expensive thing to have that many solar panels. This one is for energy conservation and for um, healthy indoor air quality. As a child care center had to mat, meet a number of very stringent um, inspections and, and regulations for um, toxicity of materials and healthy indoor air quality. So this building was built in um, uh, eight modules of, of space. So it was built in Illinois um, at a factory and then trucked from Illinois to Massachusetts. And part of what was interesting to us was um, working with the, within the context of the uh, kind of production modular building, commercial and industrial modular building um, industry. It's, it's not a very progressive industry and um, the idea of bringing in a, a green um, high performance building was a little bit of an uphill battle. Um, had to cha challenge and change a lot of expectations and we had to do a lot of learning ourselves about how the industry works and how the, uh, the process works. So along the way, we did a lot of digital modeling. We work in, in Revit primarily. So we did very, very detailed modeling of every component and part because once our drawings went to the factory, it had to happen, it was built in about six weeks in a factory. No time for asking questions. And what we know from the, the industry is um, they don't always um, adhere to architects drawings, especially if they don't understand something, there's not a lot of time for back and forth. They'll make a decision, go on and, and complete it. So we wanted to, we had a very good relationship with these, these builders. We went back and forth very quickly, but we did completely digitally fabricate everything in our, um, in our, our digital modeling and gave them drawings to show them exactly even sequence of construction issues. And it, it worked very well for uh, building a rapport with, with these people because we were essentially building it digitally before they had to build it physically and we worked through many of the issues. So uh, a lot of very custom fabricated parts besides the, the primary module, we were trying very hard to make it break out of the image of a, a modular building and to have a, a connection to the landscape. These, these changing images, it, it had a very interesting program that it would be used for eight months for one child care center and then the second eight months for another child care center as they moved it around. So part of the goal was to be able to differentiate it for as it changed, uh, changed role. So we had the, 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 the frog and the uh, cherry blossom uh, front. But the, um, the other part that was interesting from a digital fabrication point of view was this apple that we designed. You know, we wanted this uh, connection for the children to be kind of a, a fun image and the um, apple was digitally fabricated, it was modeled by us, and then all of the parts made and um, cut, uh, all CAD CAM manufactured. These are all the drawings that we did. These are the cut drawings for the, the, the milling process. And uh, a lot of work went into the, into the apple, but we, it was a tremendous learning experience for us working with good fabricators. So th that's kind of the, the total of the, the, the kind of modular building uh, interest shifting from the residential into the, the kind of commercial and education realm. So I'm going to uh, show a few things uh, that we've done with students. Um, and it's very nice uh, to have here today um, some of my former students, which makes me feel kind of old, but it's still nice to, to, uh, to see both on the faculty, which makes me feel really old. Uh, but Aaron on the faculty is uh, a former student, and Hala uh, is a more recent student, a graduate student here. So uh, Peter and I have had a chance to do uh, quite a few projects with students over the years. And uh, so we just want to show a few of these related to the other work. 
Um, this was a project, um, and Aaron might remember this, were you here at the time, um, or there at the time. Uh, so this was done at Berkeley uh, a few years ago. It was called um, Swell, and it was at a time when students were becoming very interested in parametric modeling and um, uh, dealing with the idea of buildings actually changing in response to dynamic uh, phenomena around them. So responding to the number of people that would be in a building or responding to natural forces, but responding in, a, uh, in an active uh, way. So the, the challenge was, if we're going to talk about buildings being responsive, uh, it was very popular at that time to be drawing buildings that could get big and small, uh, depending on how they were occupied, uh, which is kind of a, a difficult thing to imagine for an architect, how we're going to make that. But So we took on the challenge, we're going to make a building that can be either big or small, uh, depending on how many people are in it. So in quite a short time, the students made this uh, pretty amazing structure, and they built it on an upper floor, upper studio floor, but you can see here that it's, um, the, the structure can collapse into about a two and a half foot um, diameter, and it can swell up to be, I think it was around 18 feet in diameter. So it, it was all based on this kind of um, mechanism, uh, a mechanism of, of scissors that could be, um, Responsive. So there's this inner scissors that uh, forces the the scissored outer skin in to to change in size, and uh, there was kind of a the whole thing is pretty elegant except for this one um, kind of clunky element. But the, this floor element is the bridge that uh, people walk into, and the more people who walk onto this uh, bridge into the interior of the space. Uh, the heavier it gets and the more the bridge uh, kind of flattens out into a, a flat floor. So when the floor, as the floor flattens down with the weight of the people, the building uh, swells around it. So if there aren't many people in it, then the building's small, and if it fills up, you have a flat floor and a big building. So it was uh, an interesting challenge for them, and they came up with some great mechanisms, both to create this sort of flexible structure and then to, to mechanize it and make it responsive. And it has this kind of uh, tensile fabric skin and a very, very lightweight, uh, flexible, but quite strong uh, structure. Um, so more recently, um, we did a project uh, with the students. This was right after the um, tsunami in the Indian Ocean and at the same time as the earthquake in Kashmir and the uh, Katrina hurricane in New Orleans. All of those things seemed to happen in a very short order. So it was, uh, and now since then, we, we are increasingly all of us aware that the, there are going to be increasing seen weather events and disasters and as architects, as people dealing with the world, we have to um, start understanding our landscape in a much more dynamic uh, way and being able to respond to it. So the swell is uh, about responding and this um, project we call the life bean is about a response to disaster relief. So the students made some different proposals for making a, a pod-like structure that could uh, aggregate and create some larger communal types of spaces. So these were kind of early uh, images of it. And one of the things that people were becoming very aware of at that time was that uh, there were disaster, quick disaster relief things like tents and things like that. But uh, for example, after the earthquake in Kashmir, which was in, I think, the um, early fall, uh, problem was that people could get into the tents and, and things like that, but there wasn't any long-term response for them. So pretty soon it was snowing and they were still in the same shelters. So it became of interest uh, to make shelters that could have a kind of long-term uh, sustaining, um, life-sustaining ability and that could be uh, not so reliant on being able to uh, fly in uh, lots of uh, supplies and things, but it had to be something that 
was life sustaining within itself. So in this case, that meant it had to filter water, it had to capture water, store water, uh, filter waste, um, create a range of ventilation or warmth. Um, uh, so they, they had fairly uh, complex parameters that they wanted to, to deal with, including uh, this thing had to be collapsible, it had to be lightweight, it had to be able to fit in a helicopter. So they had a certain size uh, criteria that they were dealing with. Uh, so they made lots of mock-ups and experiments, and then material experiments decided to work with bamboo because it would be a, a, a strong material but one that could be sourced anywhere in the world so that these things could be fabricated anywhere and uh, stored ready to be to be used so it, it's a kind of spring-like uh, bamboo um, form so these things were steam bent and uh, formed into this kind of spring that could collapse into a small disc or be elongated and then it has a number of different layers that uh, create, um, that have uh, the ability to, to capture warmth and store water and open and close. And so like all of these projects, there's, um, th th there's the kind of energy of, of making them, uh, and then there's a great energy of occupying them. And that, that's, of course, the, the, the thrill of architecture. When you, when you make something, then you get to experience it and have it around you. So there's always a great party after uh, making some of these things. Um, and it, it's very exciting to have something, to have an idea, especially a challenging, difficult idea, and then uh, figure out how to make it. So this, um, this project uh, is called the, the Hot White Orange, which is a story in itself why it's the Hot White Orange. But the, the challenge for the students in this case was we wanted to make a, um, an outdoor amphitheater in, in Berkeley, which is a place that's usually sunny or frequently sunny during the day and almost always cold at night. We wanted to make a, a, a kind of large furniture for about uh, 30 people to sit outside and watch movies outside in the courtyard of the architecture building. So to do that, uh, we decided we would make a use the form of an orange as the kind of formal basis for the design because we, we didn't want to waste a whole semester on figuring out what the shape of this thing was going to be. So we just said, it's going to be an orange. It's going to be made so it's a sphere. It's going to unfold in its segments uh, so that uh, when it folds up, it conserves its heat. And when it folds open, people can sit in it. And it's going to be solar heated. Um, so that's... Uh, Sounds simple enough in theory, but it's uh, quite a process. And, and our interest in this was to um, have the students working on something that engaged every aspect of building construction, but took it out of the typical um, construction formal norms so that there wasn't a, a I was falling back on a stock detail or something. We, we had structure, we had enclosure, we had uh, electrical systems, we had plumbing systems, we had insulation. Uh, we had all of the issues of construction, but it was in a different form. So everything had to be invented. So this was digitally modeled, and there were separate teams for all of these different functions, a structures team, uh, uh, primary enclosure team, a kind of interior plumbing team, uh, but they were all able to share one digital model so that all the geometry would match and they could fabricate all their pieces and then bring them together. This was a map of where they had a lot of the parts fabricated around the, the west coast. Um, some parts were manufactured and some parts were made by the students. They brought all of these things together and then in uh, after making them all separately in two days, they had to put it all together. So it's a fairly complicated system of uh, a, a solar hydronic catchment system it goes through a solar pump and it pumps the water uh, during the day. It's collecting heat and pumping it through the these internal bladders in the orange so that they get uh, so that the larger volumes of water are heated, and then at night it unfolds and it's like a big hot uh, waterbed to sit in. Uh, so 
all of these systems, the, the plumbing systems, the, they all required a lot of research and interaction. Each student um, group, there were about 35 students working on the project and they each had went out and found their plumbing mentor, their electrical mentor, and uh, did a pretty amazing job putting this thing together. And then they, the only thing that they really argued about was what color it should be. It seemed obvious to most people that it's an orange, it might as well be orange. But uh, surprisingly, that was very controversial. So there was a, uh, it was decided it would be white, but there would be these orange uh, clothes that could kind of uh, dress it on certain occasions. So it's called the hot white orange. Um, so then uh, the most recent of these um, student projects uh, is called the enormous plastic rain flower, which is kind of a, um, a joke on, e we call it EPRF. Uh, there are all these kind of fancy plastic, construction plastics with the three or four letter names. But the EPRF in this case is the enormous plastic rain flower. And uh, the concept of this was, first of all, the school had no money for construction. There was no support for the class. There was no, uh, no income uh, available, no, no do donations. So we had to make something out of absolutely nothing. So the, the idea was, uh, what, what could we make that could be big, structural, but it would cost nothing? So th this is all done with plastic bottles that are not recyclable. Uh, so thinking that, that there's this huge waste stream in the world, and we already know it's extremely wasteful, shipping water all over the world. So all over the world, we've got all, all these plastic bottles. Uh, why don't we make a water filtration and storage system out of the, the plastic bottles so that anywhere in the world, the people will have these resources. We'll make a kind of prototype system, put it on the web, and anyone in Africa or anywhere can look, see how it's built, go to their own ditch, find all these bottles, uh, make their own filtration system, uh, which is also a shade structure, and then after that they won't have to, they'll, they'll use the detritus of this wasteful industry, and after that they won't have to buy any more bottled water. So uh, it's a kind of structural problem, it's a, a shade problem, it had to have th this height so that you could throw the water in the top or have it uh, rain and catch, uh, water and then it filters down through these mechanisms so that the structure is both pipe and, uh, and structure. Uh, so all of these bottles are f um, put together and they're put together mechanically, um, not with any gluing or anything. And then it, it filters the water at the bottom and, and stores it in the lower parts of the structure. So uh, we were very interested in this idea of what, what can we do when, when there's no money when there's a important uh, objective, program objective, uh, what, what can we do and still make it uh, fun and beautiful and um, a work of architecture uh, with, with no resources? This is the project that Yvonne did the introduction and gave the, we recorded a, a quote from this project, so that, that, that was the, the project. So I wish we had images of the project that we are currently working on with the University of Oregon Portland campus. So we're doing this uh, um, kind of series of workshops. The second one is starting up tomorrow. So you may have heard about this project. I'm sure you'll hear about it later once it's photographed and uh, documented to come down here, but it's been a, a really interesting thing over the semester, the, the quarter here. And um, they're about midway through a very ambitious uh, design build project, um, a, uh, a structure for the OCAC, Oregon College of Arts and Crafts campus. So if you haven't heard about it yet, I'm sure the, at least if it's a success and nobody is hurt, you'll hear about it. Well, you'll, you'll hear about it if anyone's hurt, but if, if the department thinks it's a success, then you'll probably hear about that project towards the end of the quarter here. Um, I'm just gonna wrap up with two, two kind of projecting towards the, um, the, the, the larger scale implementation or um, 
directions that come out of some of the the, the projects we've done. We, we've Mark and I have had a lot of a chance in our uh, practice to do a lot of projects. Tremendous amount of learning experience for us. Um, the the direction we would like to take our practice is larger projects than, than we've been doing. So we, we've had some interesting opportunities through design competitions and other um, avenues to do larger multifamily um, projects. And that seems to be kind of a, a direction, kind of projects that are more, more urban scale. So on the urban scale projects, th th this was uh, a project for New Orleans for, for after the flood. It was a high density on high ground design competition to do large, uh, a large number of, of housing units in an area of New Orleans that, that didn't seriously flood. It was a, a big competition and, and our project um, was a winner of the competition. And it was then the competition because it was very timely. This was in 2006. Um, the world all over the world the interest in um, post-disaster construction so it was invited then to be in the Biennale uh, the 2006 Biennale of Architecture in, in Venice so the, much of the imagery here in the models and, and the components were produced um, as a result of that invitation to exhibit the project in Venice as an example of kind of high density um, High, high, highly environmentally adaptive housing. So it was, it was a very interesting project for, for us to be able to connect some of our interest and in, in background in prefabricated building systems and show how those could be connected onto a much larger scale and a more, more urban scale. It was a very um, um, rich system of environmental adaptation for this building. It was all about uh, kind of creating the opportunity for a building to essentially be a, a sponge at the time when there's heavy rainfall in, in many cities. In New Orleans, part of the problem sometimes is that there's so much rain and not enough uh, way to absorb water. So we were looking at one of the, the issues of buildings being able to absorb and um, slow down the absorption of water into the, the urban city from above by having kind of a, a series of green walls and, and green landscape all within a, a kind of a prefabricated system. So the, the walls themselves have these planted, uh, planted systems. The, the buildings um, were part of the, the, the water absorption part, but the other the part of it was the um, absorption from the rising water. So, that, so you, everyone knows the, the flood in New Orleans was caused largely because of levees that, that failed that were designed to hold back the flood waters. And part of the project, uh, one of the most important part of the projects to us was the design of, of kind of soft levee, soft replacement levees of these um, um, sponge combs, we call them. In this, this kind of animation, you see them moving from their deflated condition where the wa when the waters are low, and as the floodwaters come up, the, the sponge combs expand to, um, in principle, they expand to create a, a solid wall or, or dike. It's fairly simple in, in concept because there are um, these super absorbent polymers that have been developed and are used in oil spill cleanup and also baby diapers that are all about trying to adapt um, or, or to absorb large amounts of, of moisture. Most of the uses of them so far, though, have been about um, like cleanup, like collecting the oily water or um, absorbing the water in. Our interest was the, the secondary aspect, as these polymers um, gather the water in, they physically expand. So this is back a little bit to like the swell project. How do you make something that expands? So we were interested in, as the water comes up, we, we know there's way too much water to be able to mop it up with sponges. But what we can do is use the expansion capacity of, of this polymer within a, a very carefully designed set of uh, expanding pleated bags so that as the water comes up, the water 
comes into these um, these these bags, makes the polymer swell, makes the bags um, swell against each other, and thus creating this um, kind of temporary levy. The um, the process of actually making it um, physically work was was a very interesting challenge for us. Involved lots of experiments at many scales. You know, very simple pleated paper structures that we blew up balloons in and uh, moving on to more and more complex uh, interior harnesses and, and structures. We built full scale or, or half scale mock-ups of these uh, in our office. And um, part of the challenge was we wanted them to not be single use. We wanted them to, when the sun comes out, you dry out the polymer, it actually contracts again. So we wanted there to be an internal harness to these, these structures that would be elastic and help squeeze the water out and pull them back in. So th there's no energy other than the energy of the expansion of the water and the, the drying energy. There's no, no powered energy um, um, to these. And so we, we ended up designing and then building a whole series of these um, small scale models, then larger scale mock-ups. Really fun process for us in our office to be so hands-on for the, the making of these. They were then um, put together, we had a large, uh, large team, and then they were shipped to, to Venice, and installed in the, uh, the courtyard of the, um, the US Pavilion in, in Venice, and uh, inflated, and they became this very popular element partly because there weren't many places to sit down and these were extremely comfortable. As you can imagine, once they were filled up, they became these giant water bag uh, elements, but they became kind of a, a center point um, in that year of people wanting to come and sit on them and interact with them. And we, we kind of think that's, that's the, 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 the perfect um, antithesis to the concrete uh, levee walls that failed in the the hurricanes of uh, in the, in the Katrina hurricane. Here's a, uh, a protective device for an urban protective device that becomes this kind of social gathering gathering space. Here's our uh, artist's rendering of the, the, the a whole series of these protecting Piazza San Marco in, in Venice. And uh, final image there. I'm going to just skip ahead to our final uh, project to show you sort of where we're where we're at right now in a um, uh, a current project. So turn it over to Mark. So with the, uh, that's supposed to quit at a certain point. What worse. happened? Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, good. Uh, so the, you know, in, in the New Orleans project, the, um, uh, the, this levy system, uh, the temporary levy system was a kind of, ancillary part of the project. It, it created this ability to go back and forth to the, the waterfront from, from the city, um, but it, it wasn't the building itself. But we became, th through all the research on, on that project, we became very interested in the possibility of uh, other sorts of urban infrastructure that could use this uh, super absorbent polymer technology and be become a, a kind of interactive, uh, part of the urban environment. Um, so our, our proposal, and we haven't found a place to build this yet, um, but the, the proposal is for an urban water tower, essentially, that isn't dependent on bringing water from somewhere else to, to fill the tower, but instead it, it's a kind of localized water collection apparatus, water collection, filtration, and, and storage apparatus. Uh, and it, it occupies a, uh, co-occupies um, an office building uh, tower because 
office towers um, have all of this uh, surface area available to them. So our, our thought was to take um, the, uh, the surface of, the, uh, of a building, uh, create a new building who, that, that could be occupied with the office program, but would also have this uh, mechanism that would be kind of symbiotic with the, uh, the human occupation of the building. So it uh, collects water. It's a system that um, extends. So that it's, it's called the lips tower. So the, there are lips and, and tongues in the system. And the way it works is uh, when, when the building needs uh, ventilation, the lips open. And when the uh, building needs shade, the tongue sticks out and shades the surface of the building. The uh, surface of the tongues also has a photovoltaic uh, membrane surface on it so that when they're extended to create shade, the top of it is creating energy. And when it's raining, the tongues also stick out to collect water. So it, it's completely interactive with the weather. Uh, and it, it records the weather, it, the, the kind of urban landscape that it creates is, is one that's very dynamic, very interactive, and uh, the building changes shape, changes form according to the weather and the time of day, um, and is always in motion. So that these, um, and, and it doesn't take energy to power it. It's all powered by this kind of hydrophilic superabsorbent uh, polymer in these big padded bags. So we're using the, um, the same system of the, the levee at the ground level, bringing it up into the sky and uh, having it respond to, uh, to, the, to nature, collecting the water. Uh, so the tongues collect the water on the surface, both by condensation and by direct uh, catchment of rain. It comes in, filters through this, and cycles down into storage uh, within the cells of the building. And the, uh, the, the muscles, essentially, in the, the sides of the, the, the throat are, that are sending the, um, the tongue in and out are caused to, to fold and move by the, uh, the swelling of the, uh, the moisture content in the um, in the superabsorbent polymer. So through uh, valving, uh, so it, it's responsive to uh, input from the, the weather data. Uh, it valves in and out of the, the polymer and swells or contracts and uh, then without energy just um, or, or without any um, applied energy other than the, um, the valving, it uh, changes its, its form and extension. So these are some of the, the studies of the, the tower frame. These are uh, diagrams of the, the system. And just like the, um, the sponge comb system, this is a, a fabric uh, system that is all 3D modeled digitally, unfolded and cut fabric, and then um, sewn up as this kind of large fabric uh, structure. So we made lots of models of this, just as with the sponge combs. This is uh, a model of the appearance of this building. And this is with most of the tongues extended. So the, the building form and color would change dramatically depending on uh, how it opens and closes. Um, so this is uh, another um, model, a more detailed model of the structure and the mechanism itself. Um, to test how how this thing actually works. So you can see the, the building extends its tongue, collects the water, 
and it actually swallows, using this mechanism, it actually swallows the water and brings it deeper into the structure. Uh, on the one hand, it's a very practical system. It also, we think it's uh, quite beautiful. Um, absurd, but, um, but not, uh, not entirely absurd. So uh, just in, in closing, um, well, that's a good enough closing. <laughs> Thank you. We were maybe a little long, so we won't be offended if anyone has to get up and leave. But uh, also be happy if anyone has any questions about any of the projects or wants to ask about anything. See, that's, the, that's the advantage of giving a long lecture, just you <laughs> answered all the um, questions. Have you guys done any full scale mock up? Or, I mean, you did the mock up of the, uh, um, the dike system, but have you actually? Is that a working prototype, or is that was that? That one was uh, semi-working. Semi-working. It, it doesn't have the, uh, the, the polymer with it, so it's an air, it's an air-filled thing. So it, it actually does all of the, the functions, but it doesn't have the polymer, so it can travel. And, and that it did travel. That it's traveled almost more than we have. It's, it went to. Venice and then to Singapore and Bangkok and Panama City and a few other places. It keeps getting the dirtier and dirtier and then we have to go and set it up. <laughs> yeah. the, the elephant in the room seems to be the playfulness and the rational side. Um, has it always been this clear for you? Which is the elephant? The playfulness or the <laughs> rational side? <laughs> Well, I, I don't know that there's anything clear about that, but that's, um, I, I think architecture has to be comprehensive. That, that's our, our only great specialty as, as architects. We, um, we, we have the kind of arrogance of thinking we can do anything because we're interested in everything. At the same time, we know we don't really have a lot of expertise. We have to work with other people who have the expertise in lots of these things. So our, our specialty as architects, so we have to not be embarrassed about the fact that we don't know everything. We, we have to embrace the fact that we don't know everything, but we're interested in everything. And since nobody else is putting everything together, we're the only ones who can have ideas about everything and be responsible to the, the whole range of human uh, interest and uh, engagement. So of course we have to be playful. We have to be responsible. We have to figure out how to make things. We have to figure out how they'll be beautiful and, and fun. Uh, you can't really do one or the other. Uh, us academics can pretend to be specialists in construction or specialists in history or something like that. But once you're an architect and you're actually making something, you don't get to just specialize. You have to do a little bit of everything. So if you're leaving out humor, you're not being very comprehensive. You're probably an engineer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Careful. <laughs> what is the project you're doing in Portland? Or what's the challenge? Well, the challenge there is uh, figuring out how to engage with people who don't want to be told what to do, which is always the case. Uh, so th th they're doing their own project and they've got a, uh, so we're kind of working with them, but we didn't, in that case, uh, they didn't actually choose to engage our challenge. They had their own challenge, which is great. And they're, uh, but they came up with this process of, um, you know, a kind of material process of stacking wood. And so the, um, it's, <coughs> It's almost uh, like taking a, a typical skid of lumber and having this big rectangular block of lumber that's being carved out 
so that the interior is inhabitable. So what's being created, the, the program of it on the campus of Oregon College of Arts and Crafts, is, it's kind of a, um, has multiple purposes. It, it's sort of called the smoking shelter because it's taking the place of another shelter that was allowed to be built to cover the smokers who had to be farther away from the buildings and out of the rain. So they let them build this thing, which turned out to be kind of ugly. And so now the school gave them a little bit more money to build a nice smoking shelter. So but it's not allowed to be called a smoking shelter. So it's, yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it's, a, it's a, a pavilion that is kind of a gathering space and it is to provide outdoor covered uh, a place to be outdoors and uh, it's, it'll be very interesting. It's going to be beautiful. They're, they're pouring concrete as we speak and then tomorrow we're going to help them be building up on it. So it's a very fun process. It's kind of a design as you go process. It's undigital, but it's interesting. It's another way. <laughs> Exactly. My question, sort of, to follow up on that, is uh, this may be a little bit broad, but how, what have you guys found in terms of? Because well, obviously, you're doing a lot of beautiful digital work, and you're doing a ton of modeling, real making, and full mock-up scale. So, in the interface between those two things, is is pretty interesting. I mean, obviously, there's some printing, laser cutting, but are you guys mostly doing the modeling as a separate thing, or how do those things integrate in your, in your workflow? I think we're, we're interested in, I, I think that's a little bit of an open question sure. for the field of architecture right now. And I, I think there are a lot of people interested in that and we're very much interested in it because we we started very hands-on, undigital, but we've always been interested in the integration of new tools. So we've always been kind of at this, this edge of trying to figure out how do these new tools apply to the physical world. So. Um, I don't know that we have any great insights on that other than the fact that I think it needs to be, everyone needs to keep working at it from both sides, you know, from the digital side. And I see this happening in the, the kind of people who are very interested in, in digital design. There's getting to be more and more interest edging towards how that turns into fabrication. But also from the, the other end, from the construction industry end, which is uh, notoriously slow to, uh, to transform or adapt. There are so many things that are starting to be integrated in building information modeling. And we've been able to be part of some very interesting kind of experimental projects where um, building information modeling um, is connected into the building process very directly. So it, it, as I see it, the, the move into digital fabrication, that's like just scratching the surface of bringing um, the, the, the promise of, of computation into the making of the real world. And what, what's going to be really interesting is when it gets beyond doing um, the kind of interesting pavilions out of lightweight material, which is a lot of what is, is really happening now, and where it uh, fully integrates through the process of construction but not to the point where it takes the hand out of it. You know, where it, you know, I don't really believe that it's going to turn it into a fully automated construction process. It's th there's a a role for for craft and for the hand and the human interaction that can be um, augmented by the capabilities of digital design and fabrication. So, it, to me, that that's the most exciting issue in the world of architecture and construction right now. And your generation is the one that's going to really be able to put that together. So um, I think this is a very exciting time in architecture because everyone is kind of seeing how the tools that we've, that have been developed in the last 20 years of design tools, seeing how those are related to the, the real physical world. So we expect to see great things out of uh, every succeeding generation of graduates uh, uh, figuring that out. The DMC, right. Okay. Well, maybe that's a good point. Thanks.